Does it make sense for the Boston Red Sox to move Raphael Devers to first base? More on today's Locked on Red Sox. You are Locked on Red Sox, your daily Boston Red Sox podcast. Part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. Hello and welcome to Locked on Red Sox, your daily Boston Red Sox podcast, part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. I'm your host, Gabby Hurlbut, former ESPN social media associate and current host of the Boston Balling Podcast as well. And I am here to bring you the latest in all things Boston Red Sox, Monday through Friday, straight to your favorite podcast feed. And the best part is it is all completely free. So you might as well tune in because Lockdown is your team every day. Today's episode is brought to you by FanDuel. You can start the season with a big return on FanDuel. New customers can place a $5 bet and you'll get started with $150 in bonus bets. If you win your first $5 bet, visit FanDuel.com to get started. Happy Monday. Welcome to the show. I celebrated my 29th birthday last week, which is very weird. I feel like I'm getting super old and had a great week of fun celebrations, including going to see Lion King the musical. So that was awesome. Seeing the new Wicked movie in theaters twice last week, which I highly recommend seeing if you have not yet. Amazing, incredible movie. And it's my favorite musical that I've seen on stage. So I knew I was going to absolutely love it. Nice birthday dinner with friends and family. So definitely a good busy week for me with another busy week to come with Thanksgiving being on Thursday. So happy early Thanksgiving to all of you out there who celebrate and hopefully you have some fun things planned for Thursday to spend a nice holiday with family. But As the Red Sox look to make some moves this offseason, including hopefully signing Juan Soto, teams are going to start making offers to him this week. So the first phase is over of him meeting with every team and having introductory meetings. Now teams have to put together their packages that they want to offer to him. The Red Sox are very much in the mix with that. So we'll see how things go in regards to Juan Soto when it comes to the Red Sox. But When it comes to signing people, we also have to think about what the current roster looks like and who's going to be utilized where. And one player whose name has come up in conversation a lot this offseason so far is Raphael Devers. And obviously Devers is here to stay. He's extended for another nine seasons with the Red Sox. But the question really is, does it make sense for him to play third base throughout the rest of his time in Boston, because that is the position that he has played when he's been with the Boston Red Sox. But it could make sense to start to explore another option. And the Red Sox have discussed internally the possibility of moving him to first base when they've been in their discussions about how improving the infield defense is an absolute must this offseason. As a team, they were sixth in baseball with plus 49 defensive runs saved in 2024, but that was almost entirely thanks to the outfield, which rated as plus 48 defensive runs saved. So the infield is clearly the weak spot when it comes to the defense. And Devers is one of the worst defensive third basemen in the game of baseball. He did improve a little bit last season, but he rated no better than minus five defensive runs saved in a full 162 game season. And he's also led the American league in errors at third base every year since 2018. And it's interesting because sometimes it's the routine plays that he's messing up and then he'll make some really hard challenging play. So it's definitely interesting trying to see him navigate those plays at third because a lot of the plays he should be making are the ones where he overthrows the first baseman or bobbles the baseball. So that's definitely something the Red Sox need to try to resolve. But the Red Sox understood when signing him to that long-term deal that he would finish his long-term contract at first base, eventually sliding over from third because that is a natural move once a player gets into his 30s but a move now could be earlier than the team anticipated but also could make sense given that 
he's a poor defender and that's just something that needs to improve and maybe moving him to first base will allow him to succeed a little bit more defensively if he finds that playing from that angle is easier and better for him. His agent says that he'll continue to play third base and work hard at it. That is his position. That's what he likes to play, and that's what he will be playing, at least in the near future. That's where he will be, and down the road, it's hard to say. The thing is, he's never played a single inning at first base as a professional player, not in the majors or minors. It's definitely not an easy position. Catching throws that are chest high, from other infielders is actually the easy part of the position, but the little nuances of the position, like where do I go on cutoff plays? Should I go get this ball or is it the second baseman's ball or what's my footwork, et cetera. The logistics of how to make those types of plays, that's where an experience often shows up. And if the Red Sox are going to shift him to first base, they should do it sooner rather than later because they can give him close to an entire offseason to work on it. And then he'd also get a full spring training at the position as well. So if they give him as much time in the position to get familiar with first base, that would be really beneficial for him. They can't expect him to show up to camp play 15 or so spring games at first and then be comfortable with it. It's a process that potentially could take a long time. So if they decide they're going to switch him to first base, they should make that decision sooner rather than later so that he can get more and more reps in at that position before he makes that complete transition. And even so, even if they decide now, okay, we're going to have Devers play first base, he might have a rough first season at that position as he's getting used to it. So I don't think we should expect some really clean defense from Devers at first base if he is going to play there. There are going to be some bumps in the road and some sloppiness, I suspect, from him. But the sooner that they can get past that, the more beneficial and easier it'll be for Boston. And obviously, he's still a tremendous hitter. He bat 272 with a 354 on base percentage and 516 slugging stat line with 28 homers all around dealing with that shoulder issue in 2024. And getting him off third base is the best thing for both the Red Sox and him. It might not seem like that at first because players typically do hate changing positions because obviously it's a whole new mechanic and a whole new process for going about their game. But his third base defense has truly become a huge liability. At first base, he can be really impactful to the team. And also moving him to first base opens up several possibilities for the Red Sox as they look to return to the postseason. They posted identical 78 and 84 records in 2022 and 2023 and finished in last place in the AL East both years. And then this past season, they went 81 and 81 and finished in third base. So very mediocre average team. They have a good young talent base and a great farm system, but more help is very much needed. And if they move Devers, that could help the Red Sox improve the team overall by adding more pieces because for one, him going from third base to first base creates a lane for the Red Sox to sign Alex Bregman because Bregman could come in to play third base and it would be a huge defensive upgrade that would severely help the Red Sox. He is very close with Alex Cora going back to Cora's time as Houston Astros bench coach. So that would be an easy sell to Bregman as you could be reunited with Alex Cora if you come to Boston. They're even so close that they make friendly college football bets with each other during football season. So they're on a friendship type of basis. He's obviously comfortable with Cora. So that could be a selling point for Bregman. And the fact that they've met with Juan Soto recently indicates that they will spend money this offseason, whether Soto comes here or not. Outbidding the two New York teams for him could be tough, but luring Bregman to Boston figures to be easier. And his swing is absolutely tailor-made for Fenway Park. He always hits well against the Red Sox at Fenway. 
He went seven for 12 with two doubles and two homers at Fenway in 2024. So bringing Bregman in would be a massive defensive upgrade in the infield for the Red Sox. No question about it. And he's consistently ranked among the league leaders in pulled fly ball rate throughout his career. A right-handed hitter who puts the ball in the air is built to hit well at Fenway Park with the green monster and with doubles and home runs that he could rack up. Signing him would not only improve the third base defense, but it also would be a right-handed power bat that the Red Sox are coveting. So those are pros to them moving Devers to first is it would allow for a defensive upgrade at third base. And then also Tristan Casas would become a trade piece if they were to move Devers to first. I mean, I like Tristan Casas. I think there's so much potential for him, but it wouldn't make sense to have him around if the Red Sox were to make this decision and make Devers a first baseman. So with him only being 24 years old, Casas slashed a 241 batting average, 337 on base percentage and 462 slugging with 13 home runs in 64 games around that rib injury in 2024. In parts of three big league seasons, he's a 250, 357, 473 overall hitter and has averaged 31 home runs per 162 games. I mean, the kid can really hit. But just like Devers, he's a pretty poor defender. And the Red Sox already have a big money full-time DH in Yoshida. And unless the Red Sox find a trade partner for him, which seems unlikely given his contract of three years and $55.8 million remaining, Casas would become a player without a position should the Red Sox go ahead and move Devers over to first base. So then in that case, he becomes a valuable trade piece because if you pair him with somebody like Will Abreu in the outfield, you can get really solid pitching in return for that because he's shown he can hit at the big league level and he's under team control for another four seasons. So a team could be really attracted to that. They can move Devers to first base and then trade him for some desperately needed high-end pitching because of his talent. So that all comes into question is, are the Red Sox confident enough endeavors to move him to third base? Do they feel like that's something? Are they confident enough endeavors to move him to first base? Are they confident enough that that's something that will benefit them? Will they deal with the growing pains of him transitioning to first, but then knowing that it was worth it because he will be a guy who's going to provide a lot of value there. And then in that case, they could sign somebody like Alex Bregman and trade Casas for pitching, and that could majorly upgrade the team. But are they ready to make that move? That's the question that is going to likely be answered throughout the rest of this offseason. And we'll have to see if they decide to make that transition. But if they do know there are going to be some growing pains with Devers at first base, and we won't necessarily see him completely dominate his defense at first. But I'm sure the Red Sox will make the decision that's best for the organization. And coming up, the Red Sox made a load of roster moves over this past week. So coming up, I'm going to be going over those next. I absolutely love steak. It is literally my favorite food in the entire world. And nothing delivers comfort and joy quite like the unrivaled quality and taste of Omaha Steaks. This year, skip the holiday hustle and bustle and save 50% off site-wide during their cyber sale at omahasteaks.com. Plus, get a $30 reward card when you shop early and score an extra $30 off with promo code MLB. With five generations of experience, Omaha Steaks consistently delivers the world's best steak experience, and their gifting experts have made it easy to deliver the perfect gift with thoughtfully curated gift packages starting at $89.99. From legendary steaks to mouthwatering desserts and more, save 50% off site-wide during the cyber sale at omahasteaks.com. Plus, our listeners get an extra $30 off with promo code MLB and a $30 reward card when you shop early. That's 50% off at omahasteaks.com, O-M-A-H-A, steaks, and an extra $30 off with promo code MLB. Minimum purchase may apply. With the holiday season coming up, I'm sure 
you will be taking full advantage of this, especially if you and your family and friends are steak lovers like myself. So absolutely jump on that great deal today. As the Red Sox start to finalize rosters with their current players and figure out who's going to be part of the future. They did make a plethora of roster moves last week, starting with adding two top prospects to the 40-man roster, which protects them from the Rule 5 draft. So this past Tuesday was the MLB deadline for teams to add players to their 40-man roster and protect them from being selected by another team in the Rule 5 draft. So what is the Rule 5 draft exactly? If you don't know, it's held each December and it allows clubs without a full 40-man roster to select certain non-40-man roster players from other clubs. So people who are eligible are players who haven't been added to a team's 40-man roster within a certain number of years. It's four years for players who signed at 19 or older and five years for players who signed at 18 or younger. So if a team doesn't have these players on their 40-man roster, then any club is able to take them in the Rule 5 draft. So the Red Sox protected two players from the Rule 5 draft by adding them to their 40-man roster in right-handed pitcher Hunter Dobbins and outfielder Joe Stinson Garcia. Dobbins is 25 years old and was an eighth-round draft pick of the Red Sox in 2021 out of Texas Tech. In 25 starts between AA Portland and AAA Worcester this year, he posted a 308 ERA and 8.6 Ks per nine innings over 125 and two thirds innings. He finished the season as Boston's 18th best prospect and fifth best pitching prospect by Sox prospects. Garcia is 21 years old and signed with the Red Sox as an international free agent in 2019 at just 16 years old. In 2024, he moved quickly through the system, starting in low A Salem, getting promoted to high A Greenville, and finishing in double A Portland. So he showed very early on that he had potential in the minors. In 107 games across all three levels, he hit 286 with an 892 OPS, 23 home runs, 66 RBIs, and 17 stolen bases. The outfielder, who's nicknamed the password because of the complicated spelling of his first name, finished the year as Boston's 15th best prospect by Sox prospect, two spots ahead of his brother, Red Sox catcher prospect, Jonan Fran Garcia. So the Red Sox decided that, hey, we see potential in these two guys so we don't want them to be available for other teams to select. So they have added those two to the 40-man roster. So as a result, they had to make a couple roster moves to make moves for these two on the 40-man roster. So as a result, they DFA'd right-handed pitchers Isaiah Campbell and Brian Mata in order to make room for the two newbies on the 40-man roster. So those two had this agreement with the Red Sox, who did not tender 2025 contracts to them. So they hit free agency, but then quickly soon after that, they turned around and agreed to minor league deals with both of them. They both had been DFA'd on Tuesday for those prospects who were added to the 40-man roster. But then the Red Sox waited until the non-tender deadline to cut them loose, which sent them to free agency without needing to run them through waivers. But then they circled right back around to work out contracts that didn't take up a 40-man spot. So they both have minor league deals, but will both be in big league camp as non-roster invitees. Mata is 25 years old and was once among the most highly touted pitchers in the Red Sox system. The Venezuela native posted excellent numbers in the low minors and earned a 40-man roster spot after the 2020 season, but he unfortunately hasn't made it to the big leagues four years later, largely because of injury. He underwent Tommy John surgery early in the 2021 season and hasn't topped 83 innings in a minor league season since then. 
a hamstring strain limited him to 22 and two thirds innings between four minor league levels this year. And he turned in a 437 ERA as he tried to work to the majors. He's allowed 4.87 earned runs per nine through 87 career triple A frames. And he struggled to throw strikes consistently, but he routinely posts huge ground ball numbers. So it really comes down to him being healthy and if he can stay healthy and stay consistent he can work on his game a little bit more in the minors and then maybe eventually the Red Sox will call him up to the major league team but it's kind of sad that injuries have held him back as much as they have and then Campbell a 27 year old also lost most of the season to injury he was acquired from the Mariners last offseason for infielder Louis Urias and only pitched six and two-thirds innings in a Red Sox uniforms he was blitzed for a 13 runs in that small sample size, which is a far cry from the 283 ERA. He posted in 27 appearances for the Mariners as a rookie. And he missed time with a shoulder impingement and elbow inflammation amidst a difficult year. He fared much better in a limited sample size in Triple A, where he struck out 19 batters while allowing only four runs over 16 and a third innings. So his time in the majors was really rough, obviously showed a lot more success in the minor league system. So the Red Sox are hoping that he can continue to pitch in the minors and he could end up being a career minor leaguer if he's only showing that he has the ability to perform well when he has less pressure on him and he's in the minors. So they weren't in free agency for very long. They both got brought back on minor league deals. But also, the Red Sox had Bailey Horn placed on waivers who really struggled in 2024. But he was claimed off of waivers by the Detroit Tigers, which a lot of people were surprised about because he did struggle posting a 650 ERA with 10 walks and 13 strikeouts across 18 innings in 18 MLB games in 2024, making his MLB debut in late June. He also had a 454 ERA in 30 games at the AAA level. So his numbers at the major league level were really rough when he was with the Red Sox and inconsistency was the biggest thing for him that he wasn't able to maintain good control of that strike zone and he was kind of all over the place and hitters would absolutely wreck him. So I'm glad he's not in Boston anymore, but good for the Tigers for wanting to take him on and try to fix him. And the Red Sox also decided to tender 2025 contracts to all 29 remaining unsigned players on their major league roster. 10 players are already under contract for 2025 in Brian Bayo, Rafael Devers, Lucas Giolito, Liam Hendricks, Sadam Rafaela, Rob Refsnyder, Trevor Story, Garrett Whitlock, Justin Wilson, who they signed recently, and Masataka Yoshida. So everybody else who was unsigned is going to be there in 2025 on some sort of contract. And then with Bailey Horn being claimed by the Tigers, that puts the Red Sox 40-man roster at 39. So they do have one spot available. Whether they decide to use that on a Rule 5 draft pick or they bring somebody else up or they trade for somebody big or sign a free agent, that's still up in the air, but they do technically have an open 40-man roster spot now. But the Red Sox also did agree to two minor league deals with Sebi Zavala and Nate Eaton as well. Sebi Zavala is a catcher and Nate Eaton is more of a utility player. He would earn a 780K base salary if selected to the 40-man roster. And both players will be invited to Major League Spring training. Zavala spent the 2024 season in the Mariners organization. Seattle acquired him alongside relief prospect Carlos Vargas in the trade that sent Eugenio Suarez to the Diamondbacks. The hope was that Zavala, who's a terrific defender behind the plate, could hold down the backup job to workhorse catcher Cal Rowley. But things didn't exactly pan out that way. He's 31 years old and has never hit much, but last year's stat line of 154 batting average, 214 on base percentage, and 282 slugging in a tiny sample of 43 plate appearances 
was just too anemic for the Mariners to stomach. He ended up being DFA'd three different times, but opted to stick with the Mariners via outright assignment each time. And then he became a minor league free agent at the end of the season. He's appeared in 194 big league games and is a career 205 hitter with a 271 on base percentage and 342 slugging in that time. He has shown passable power for his position and also displayed some pop in the minors, but he has struck out in a staggering 35.9% of his 557 big league plate appearances. That lack of contact leaves him with practically no hope of producing at even an average level. So I think it'll be really difficult for him to make it up to the majors. But defensively, it's a different story because he regularly posts elite framing marks and draws above average grades for his ability to block pitches in the dirt. He posted a below average caught stealing rate in 2023, but was within one percentage point of league average in both 2024 and 2022. The Red Sox currently also only have two catchers on the 40-man roster and Connor Wong and Mickey Gasper. So adding some experienced depth makes sense, but I'm hoping they sign another catcher who's a little bit more reliable offensively. Eaton, who turns 28 next month, didn't play in the big leagues this past season, but logged 72 games and 178 plate appearances for the Royals from 2022 and 2023. He batted only 201 with a 266 on base percentage and 283 slugging in that time. But the versatile right-handed hitter has a far better track record in the upper minors. In parts of three seasons in AAA Omaha, he's a 261 hitter with a 320 on base percentage and 455 slugging with 40 homers and 60 steals in 255 games. That's 1,060 plate appearances. He has played primarily third base in his professional career, but has at least 600 innings at each of the three outfield slots, in addition to another 350 frames at second base and 60 at shortstop. StatCast credited him with 97th percentile sprint speed in his two big league seasons, measuring him at a blazing 296 feet per second. So he definitely has some upside, and the Red Sox bench should have some spots up for grabs. So he could end up being on the major league team. It's hard to really know for sure until he performs and the Red Sox really see what he's capable of. But he was another player that the Red Sox brought on to the minor league system. So they're hoping to see what he can do in terms of his reliability and playing multiple positions. And then they'll evaluate from there. And another thing that involves the Red Sox roster is Red Sox minor league pitcher Rafi Heal currently with the DSL Red Sox, has received a 56-game suspension without pay for testing positive for Stenozolol, a PED, and he was one of two minor leaguers disciplined, the other being Cleveland's Abraham Tejada. So the Red Sox were pretty busy when it came to roster moves as of late, but not anything major. No big-named players have signed yet. I think Juan Soto basically controls the market when it comes to the big time player signing. I think once he sums somewhere, once he signs somewhere, then other players will start to also sign. So we'll see what happens as the rest of the off season progresses. But the Red Sox did also finalize their coaching staff for 2025. And coming up, I'm going to be going over everybody who's going to be on the Red Sox pitching staff in that dugout next season. Get ready to tackle the NFL action with FanDuel. America's number one sports book. Because right now, new customers can bet $5 and get 150 in bonus bets if you win. The FanDuel Sportsbook app gives you everything you need to place live bets on the NFL, all in one place. So when you get a hunch in the middle of the game, you can check out the latest stats, view live play-by-play, -play, and so much more on the same page where you place your bets. Just visit FanDuel.com to join today. You'll get started with $150 in bonus bets if you win your first $5 bet. That's FanDuel.com. Never waste a hunch and make every moment more with FanDuel, an official sportsbook partner of the NFL. If you like making money and you like sports, FanDuel is the perfect place for you. So don't hesitate to check that out. When the Red Sox are working to finalize their roster for 2025, they also recently announced the finalized coaching staff 
for the upcoming season, including announcing an expanded role for mainstay Jason Veritek. He will retain his title of game planning coordinator, but will also transition from the club's catching coach to become Boston's run prevention coach. Parker Gwynn, who was recently hired away from the New York Yankees, will take over as catching instructor and bullpen catcher. And former Worcester Red Sox bench coach Jose Flores will be the club's new first base coach. Flores will succeed Andy Fox, who was let go following the season after one year in the role. Previously announced hires Dylan Lawson, who's the assistant hitting coach, and Chris Holt, the bullpen coach, were also officially confirmed to the staff. Gwen is 31 years old and spent the past two seasons with the Yankees as a manager in the Dominican Summer League. He has also coached for numerous college programs after playing for the University of Washington in Southern Illinois, Edwardsville. Flores is 53 and has spent the past three seasons as the Woo Sox bench coach after previously serving as the Phillies first base coach in 2018 and the Baltimore Orioles third base coach from 2019 to 20. The Puerto Rican native has been coaching in various roles since 2001, including with Team Puerto Rico in the 2013 World Baseball Classic. Alex Cora coming back as the manager, Ramon Vasquez as the bench coach, Andrew Bailey as the pitching coach, Pete Fatsy as the hitting coach, Ben Rosenthal as the assistant hitting coach, Kyle Hudson as the third base coach slash outfield instructor, and Charlie Madden as the bullpen catcher are all staying in their existing roles in 2025. So that is the summary of the coaching staff for Boston heading into this upcoming season. And while a lot of the names on the coaching staff might not mean a lot to some people, it is important to have the right coaching in there in order to elevate the players who are on the team. because. If you have a coach in a specific role consistently year after year, but you're not seeing overall growth and development from the players, it then leads to a question of, okay, there needs to be a coaching change here. Somebody else needs to come in and work with these guys to allow them to be more successful because we've seen it happen before where guys only last one season as a coach in a respective position that they're in. And it's because the team realizes, okay, things are not working well here. This guy is not the answer. So we need to find somebody else who can be more successful when it comes to working with our guys. So all very important pieces to Alex Cora's coaching staff. And I'm excited to see Veritek in an elevated role. I think he really deserves it. He has a ton of knowledge about the game of baseball. He's a winner. And he knows how to communicate with the players on a regular basis to help get them through high pressure situations, help keep them motivated when things are going south and when things are going well, keep a good head on their shoulders so that they can stay focused on their goals. So having Jason Veritek around in a more advanced capacity, I think is only going to benefit the Red Sox in the long run as opposed to keeping him limited to the role that he's been in in the past. So I'm curious to see how that really makes a difference for the Red Sox moving forward. But Alex Cora is the manager for the next few years, as he did sign that extension with the Red Sox over the summer. So having Cora there alongside a very supportive coaching staff should be a recipe of success for Boston. But the other biggest thing is going to be, can the Red Sox stay healthy? Are they capable of putting together a healthy roster in 2025? Are guys going to be able to consistently play? Because that has been a downfall of this team for the last few seasons is having lots of injuries and guys not being able to stay healthy. So I am eagerly anticipating what will hopefully be a very strong competitive season and most importantly, fun season for the Boston Red Sox as we turn the page to 2025 But like I always say, you just have to keep the faith because that will keep the Red Sox going and will keep them believing in themselves. And if they don't believe in themselves, nobody else were. So that is on us to make sure that we're believing in the Red Sox and this new coaching staff. Thank you for making Locked On Red Sox your first listen today. For your second listen, find Locked On MLB. Baseball guru Sully brings a daily blend of humor and baseball, keeping you updated on every rumor and story throughout the offseason. Find Locked on MLB on YouTube or wherever you listen to podcasts. Sully's show is great. 
I really enjoy listening to him and I've done episodes with him before. So make sure you tune into his show right after this. Keep the faith, go Red Sox, and I will catch you on the flip side.